Therefore, we ought to give the more energy heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. That word sleep means drift. At any time we should let them drift away. That means they have the capacity to drift away. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How many of you notice that whenever the Bible talks about the law or talks about the Old Testament, it connects it to angels? If the word spoken by angels, spoken by angels. So uh, the Old Testament was uh, administered by angels. Then he said, how shall we escape in verse 3? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Began to be spoken by the Lord. Jesus began to speak about salvation, but he did not complete the speaking of it. Which began to be spoken. Why couldn't he complete the speaking of this salvation? Because the natural man in his day could not handle the depth of this revelation so he began speaking salvation but he didn't even take them into the depths of salvation he just began and when he he, he caught their attention you know he, he he died and he said to them i have many things to say to you but you cannot bear it now but how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will complete this thing that I've just started and he will give you the full import and the full revelation of what I have just started. If you're with me to this point, say a good amen. So the Lord began, you see that, the Lord began, he began to speak about this salvation. Um, and the Lord here is Jesus himself. The Lord Jesus began to speak about it. And in the Gospels was where he began. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But he couldn't complete it because he was addressing people that were in a state of, of, of carnality, natural men, that could not handle spiritual things. Because what Jesus wanted to talk about when it comes to salvation was spiritually deep. And it would take some capacity, spiritual capacity, to handle what Jesus was to share with them on salvation. But they couldn't handle it, so he began to speak about it. And he says, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard that heard him now that word him is in italics so remove that him because the impression that him gives to you is that the people that confirmed what jesus began to teach were the people that heard him but the people that heard him didn't understand what he was talking about so it wasn't the people that heard him that confirmed what he began to talk about so when you remove him it is the people that heard the people that heard the holy ghost the spirit of truth okay what eyes have not seen ears have not heard neither has it occurred to the hearts of men the things that god has prepared for those that love him but they are revealed to us by the spirit okay the spirit speaketh the deep things the spirit speaketh the deep thing so it is confirmed to those that heard that they heard the spirit the spirit speaks the deep things that why the deep things of salvation are revealed in the epistles are you with me here all right so the deep things he says spoken by the lord the lord began to speak it jesus began to speak it and was confirmed unto us by them that heard them that heard people like paul People like Peter, them that heard by revelation. People that the Holy Ghost revealed this to because of their capacity to hear. See, I hear you. All right. You know, I told you that Hebrews 1 is pregnant. We'll be opening it small, small. Okay. And in the course of Soteria, we'll, we'll keep opening that place small, small until we get all the Jews that is in there. Somebody shout hallelujah. So the writer of Hebrews was talking about, you know, he was concerned about this salvation, but the writer of Hebrews approached it from the area of types, shadows, offerings. 
the types and the shadows and the offerings of the old testament bringing them out and out of the types and the shadows and the offerings he was revealing the reality which is christ that's why hebrews you will see types and shadows then you will see the reality types and shadows he was it, it's a book of contrast showing us the types and shadows as they are pointers to the real which is christ so that's where the whole book of hebrews all you'll be seeing there is types and shadows and the reality in contrast even the offerings he was talking about you know the contrast as it reveals christ because the bible is a christocentric book and the message is christ jesus is the message verse 4 god also bearing them witness but with signs and wonders with diverse miracles and gifts of the holy ghost according to his own will so the angels spoke the law christ speaks the gospel the angels spoke the law christ jesus spoke the gospel from what we have read now so jesus is the speaking of the gospel so it says if we neglect the word neglect there means despise if we despise he didn't say if we if we do not obey he said if we do not if we do, if we despise he's not talking of obedience he's talking about despising neglect how shall we escape if we neglect he didn't say how shall we escape if we don't obey he said if we neglect all right this is important and put it somewhere around your 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 your, your mind it, it will hook up somewhere in a very sh short moment so therefore it means that he's talking about thoughts here because uh, you know um uh, uh, neglecting is in the thoughts is in the mind you can neglect it in your mind for example somebody says well you know if 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 a believer you know is caught up with with the faults faults of sin and sin and but he's a believer is born again and is overtaken in a fault of sin and the trumpet sounds he will not make it somebody who says that has neglected because we know that it is not because a believer is not sinning that he's saved it is because the believer believes in jesus but when you reduce the entire framework of redemption and salvation to works you have neglected and when you neglect what christ has done no escape hey are you with me here yeah when you start reducing the framework of salvation to human effort to what man can do what man can afford you are neglecting and he says if you neglect he didn't say if you disobey you are not disobeying but you are neglecting you are treating light what it cost christ his entire life so if you neglect there is no escape say with me very loud clean and clear i do not neglect the sacrifice of jesus on the cross he did it for me there is nothing i can do to improve on what he has done or to add to what he has done he did it complete and perfect thank you jesus now when you say that and believe that you are not neglecting you are not neglecting how shall we escape if we neglect that's where the problem is if we take for granted or treat lightly or or lightly esteem this so great salvation can somebody shout hallelujah now first corinthians 6 19 what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost in you remove which is because which is is not in the original manuscript is 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 in italics your body is the temple of the holy ghost in you which you have of god and you are not your own everybody touch your body touch your body say my body say it again touch your body say this body is the house of the holy ghost say it again one more time now if this body is the house of the holy ghost then this body is saved the holy ghost cannot live in a house that he has not purchased he's not a tenant he's the owner of the body so that means the body is saved what does it mean to be saved it means it has been purchased now that is not to say that the body has been fully redeemed 
But the body is saved. It's saved. If it's not saved, the Holy Ghost won't live there. He's living there because he has paid for it. It's his property. Look at it. You are not your own. Somebody say, I'm not my own. Say it very loud. Now, once you know that, sickness can't stay there. You are not your own. Next verse. For you are bought with a price. Did he say you will be bought? You are bought. Say, I am bought. Yeah, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit. That means the same way your body has been saved is the same way your spirit is saved. It's the same. Question, is your spirit saved? Are you sure? Is your body saved? Are you sure? Because in that verse, he now categorizes your spirit and your body in the same state. Glorify God in your body and where? In your spirit, which are God's. That's why you don't treat your body anyhow. Because so many people treat their bodies anyhow, thinking that this body is a container of sin. Eh -eh. If your body is a container of sin, you're not born again. You are bought with a price. This body has been paid for. It has been purchased. It has the seal of God on it. And God is living inside as his house. I will live in them. I will walk where? In them. They shall be what? My people. I shall be their God. So say with me again. My body is saved. The body is saved. But the body has not received full redemption. The redemption, the completion of the redemption of the body is immortality swallowing mortality, which is going to happen. The seal, the guarantee that immortality will swallow up mortality is the fact that the body is saved. The body is saved. That's why you don't abuse it. Glorify God with it. The same way your spirit is glorifying God because of salvation, your body also glorify God because of salvation. See, I hear. Yeah, wake up, wake up, because I'm, I'm, I'm able to balance. He said, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So your body is saved. And I gave an illustration for those of you that were in the service. It's like in those days when Seven Up used to do promotions on Mirinda. I use mirinda because I like mirinda when it's very cold. So when you drink mirinda or seven up in the cup, they put a gift in some of them when they're doing promotions. So when you open it and you, 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 you peel off the rubber on the cup, you will see a car or you will see uh, another bottle or you will see three bottles. Is that true? How many of you have been there before? Now, when you see that, what do you do? You rejoice. Then you keep the cup. Then you go to the headquarters of Mirinda or Seven Up. It is called Redemption Center. Is that true? What is it called? Redemption Center. Then when you get there, what do you do? You give them the cup and in place of the cup, you collect the gift. Kabotanaga. Your body is the cup that guarantees that there is a gift on Redemption Day. And so on the day of the rapture, you have to give them this body. Then for this body, they give you the glorified body. But if this body is not saved, then there will be no glorified body. If that cup doesn't have the winning number and the winning thing, even if you take it there, it will be rejected. The abote kemota, the guarantee that there will be a redemption is that this cup you got is a saved cup. Lift your right hand and shout, I am saved. Spirit, soul, body. And say this body will be redeemed at the point of translation from mortality to immortality at the sound of the trumpet. Amen. Amen. I'm sure nobody has any problem with that. 
Your body is saved. So glorify God in it. Glorify God in it. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't abuse it. Jesus paid for it. And the price he paid for that body is eternal. It's eternal price. It's not temporal price. Hallelujah. That's why that's a guarantee that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Hey, look. On that resurrection money is this body that will rise. It is at the point of rising when the body has been put together. Because some people, when they die, their body is buried in a place and in the course of reconstructing the city, they scatter it and take some part of it to Aba, some part of it to Orok, because they are reconstructing the city and they leave some part. So on the resurrection morning, when the trumpet sounds, all the parts of the body will come together and form the body back. Then when it is formed, a change takes place. And all this will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Teaching good. It's called the blessed hope. That is what Romans was talking about. That, that even we, our bodies, we groan for their full redemption. Because in your body you know that there is a better realm than this. And you hunger and desire to be clothed with that, with that new self of yours. That new body that will exchange for this mortality. You yearn for immortality because you, are, you have a test. You have a foretaste of immortality. What is the foretaste of immortality? Salvation, eternal life. Eternal life inside you is a foretaste of immortality. Every time you pray in the spirit, you sense the celestial. You sense the celestial. You sense the realm of God. You, you experience it. You have rapture moments where you leave this world for some moment and you're caught up. You're not here. And then you come back. You are sensing that which is to come and you desire to enter there now. But you can't enter fully now until the redemption. That is why it's because your body is saved that you can drink deadly thing and it shall not hurt you. It's because your body is saved. That's why you can rebuke sickness and stop it from penetrating your body. It is because your body is saved. That's why you can renew it. I'm teaching now. Now, I'm going somewhere. But this body that has been bought, saved, secured, Paul said, you glorify God in it. Because you know what has happened to it. You know that this house is not Satan's address. So Satan's activities should not be carried out there. You know. You know. And I'm going to get into that now. So if sickness does not glorify God, what do you do? You stop it from entering the body because the body is supposed to glorify God. Sugar diabetes doesn't glorify God. So what do you do? You stop it. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Let's look at it. In whom also, after that you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of what? Your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Ghost a promise. How many of you are believers here? Say with me, I believe. Therefore, I am sealed with the Holy Ghost of promise. Next verse 14. Which is the earnest? The Holy Ghost of promise is the earnest of our inheritance until he is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The purchased possession so the holy ghost is the earnest of this purchase possession until the redemption before the redemption the holy ghost lives here as the earnest he lives here as the custodian he lives here as the owner as a caretaker and he will be here taking care of this body until the day when the purchased possession is redeemed and the redemption of this purchased possession is at the moment when mortality exchanges for immortality see i hear you 
purchase possession unto the praise of his glory. Teaching good? What is NS? NS means something paid down. The Holy Ghost is the down payment. He's the down payment until the redemption of the purchased is already purchased. Not of the redemption of to be purchased. The redemption of the purchased possession. The Holy Ghost is the down payment. The guarantee that this body will be changed. Therefore, because the Holy Ghost guarantees it, it is saved. See, I hear. I mean, it's been paid for. Satan can't live there. It's just that it has not been collected. But it has been paid for. Yes, and guaranteed. Fully paid for. Teaching good. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Second Timothy tells us something else. First of all, Romans 8.23 tells us something else. So, the body will be, Im will be mortal until it is swallowed up of life. To be swallowed. Life will swallow it. Romans 8.23 And not only, but ourselves also, which we have the first fruits of the spirit. Who is the first fruit of the spirit? Eh? Jesus. Jesus is the first fruit. We have Jesus. We have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves... We groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. What is the adoption? The redemption of the body. We groan because we desire to, 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 to put on the celestial body. Yeah, because we have a foretaste of what it will be like when mortality puts on immortality. We have an idea of it. So we groan, we desire to put on that body. Say, I hear you. So that when somebody tells you it is normal to be sick, tell him, <laughs> in where I come from, we don't get sick. There's nothing normal about it. Say, I hear. I'm not hearing. Say, I hear you. Yeah? Look at 2 Timothy 1.10. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Who had abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus abolished death and brought life, life and immortality to light through the gospel. So through the hearing of the gospel, life and immortality is communicated to you. You have life and immortality through the gospel. How did you get that? That whosoever believeth in the gospel shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting what? Life. That everlasting life is immortality. There's an immortal being inside you that does not die. And that immortal being is helping to keep this mortal being strong and alive for as long as possible until the glorified body swallows the, the mortal body. Yeah, foretaste of it. Oh, what a foretaste glory of glory divine. Sometimes you sing, you don't even know what you're singing. Oh, what a foretaste. You have the foretaste now. When you drink poison and it doesn't hurt you, for taste when you touch deadly things and the heart don't hurt you for taste when a serpent bites you and you shake up the beast into the fire for taste hey see I hear that's why when Jesus rose the full the full taste of it was he walked into a room without a window and a door making you see that this is what all of you will do when you put on the body I'm putting on and he said this body has no flesh and bones not flesh and blood because blood has gone on the mercy seat the only thing remaining in the glorified body is flesh and bones are you hearing so life and immortality is brought to light through the gospel the preaching of the gospel gives people eternal life and that eternal life overshadows the spirit 
an impact majorly on the body awaiting the full redemption. See, I hear you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, where people get confused is in the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Open to it. Because even the, the soul is saved. The soul is saved. Because the soul is part of the spirit. The soul is part of the spirit. The soul was not created. The soul only emerged when the spirit entered the body. Because the soul gives expression to the spirit in the natural. It wasn't created. That's why most times the Bible will talk about spirit and body. Spirit and body. And when he talks about the soul, he will say the spirit of your mind. Because the soul and the spirit are together. If you're hearing, say I hear you. I'm not hearing you, say I hear you. Look at Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore because this, this scripture has messed up with a lot of people and it's because it's not being rightly divided. So let's rightly divide it. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living what? Sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God which is what? Your reasonable service. Now look at it. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your body. You present what? your body you present what your body you present your body living sacrifice not a living sacrifice you present your body living sacrifice that means the body is already a living sacrifice in the original manuscript that a is not there present your body living sacrifice which is holy and acceptable so let's deal with the word present the word present means reckon. Reckon your body. You are not the one presenting it. It's not presenting in the sense of presenting. It is presenting in the sense of reckon. Reckon your bodies. Acknowledge. Consider that your body, your body, is living sacrifice see it living sacrifice not as a living uh -uh. it is already you are not the one presenting it a living sacrifice it has been made a, it has been made a living sacrifice how i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live i'm already crucified I'm not going to, to, to crucify. I'm crucified with him by identification. So what do I do? I consider. I see. I call my body living sacrifice. I call it. Somebody say, I am a living sacrifice. I call my body. I call it. I call it holy. I call it acceptable. I call it living sacrifice. See, I hear you. I'm not hearing you. It is the calling of it. The considering of your body. The acknowledgement of your body. Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. That is your reasonable service. The service of reasonability to God is when you acknowledge that your body is holy. Your body is acceptable and your body is living sacrifice. When you acknowledge that, it's a reasonable service. Not that you are the one that will make it a reasonable service. No, it has been made by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ by identification. If you will have to present, then you are not identifying. When he died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he was crucified, I was crucified. When he rose, I rose. It's identification. Teaching. I say teaching. Your body a living sacrifice. The second meaning of, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present. The second meaning of present means to acknowledge it. Number one, it means to reckon. To see. Number two, to acknowledge how do you acknowledge it? God calls it holy. What do you do? You call it holy. God calls it acceptable. What do you do? Acceptable. God calls it living sacrifice. What do you do? 
you call it living sacrifice when you call it what god calls it it becomes an acceptable service don't call your body unholy because god didn't call it that the price paid on it is not an unholy price i'm teaching now if you understand in short i hear you so he said glorify god in that body glorify god in that spirit which is his first john 3 1 behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called what the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not okay it doesn't know him next verse beloved now are we the sons of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be like but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is we shall be as he is our bodies will be glorified like his somebody shout hallelujah so that's why your body therefore is the house of god because eternal life lives inside there so treat it in a way it will glorify god somebody shout my body will glorify god now the soul is also saved how do we know second corinthians 4 3 second corinthians 4 now i'm messing up with a lot of things you've you've learned before and you've been taught before i'm messing it up because it's good to mess it up so we can fix it well but if our gospel be hid it is hid to them that are lost how are they lost next verse in whom the god of this world has blinded the minds so a man that is not born again his mind is not saved and what is the condition of an unsaved mind it is blinded but you that your mind is saved it has been unblinded and because it has been unblinded that's why you can renew it if it wasn't unblinded you cannot renew it to renew that mind is because that mind has been saved so because it has been saved it can comply with the new life in that man for an unbeliever his mind is blind lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel of christ who is the image of god they can't see it that's why they cannot come to church that's why our preaching is foolishness to them but when they stay and hear it well and they are willing to understand it the holy ghost assists them then when they receive christ in that process their minds are unlocked and then now the message starts making meaning and when the message starts making meaning a reconstruction and a realignment of the mind to think in line with god's thought begins to happen effortlessly why because of the payment on that mind you have the mind of christ you have the mind of christ so that ideas can flow without restriction exploits can happen your brain is not blocked it's been unblocked by redemption Just lift your hands and shout i am saved spirit soul body therefore i glorify god in my spirit my soul my body which are gods you didn't shout a good amen good teaching here tonight glorify god jesus paid the price for a new way of thinking that's why you can think in a new way he said i've got a new way of living i'm abiding and abiding in the i've got a new way of thinking that's salvation i can't be born again and be thinking those dummy things i used to think supposing i sleep and i don't wake up that's nonsense i will wake up I can't be born again and I'm thinking those stupendous things. Supposing as I'm sitting in this room that there's no light now, one thing just stands up and starts walking to me. I crush it. Because whoever falls on the rock is broken and who the rock falls upon is grinded to powder. So whichever way, I'm in charge. Supposing I travel and I don't come back, I can't think like that. You're going out and you're coming back. So if there is a going out, there must of necessity be a coming back. I can never go out and not come back. It's not in the promises of God. 
I can't think like that. I cannot think of supposing I end up on a wheelchair. No wheelchair is wheelchair enough for me to sit on. My two legs will be kicking. It will be kicking. Why? It has been paid for. It has been paid for to stay healthy, to remain strong, and to remain well. No fear here. Why? The price is paid in full. Teaching good here tonight. So I can't think dummy. No. I can't go for interview and I'm turned down. Even if I don't know the answer, my smile will score for me. Yes, if I don't know the answer, by the time I smile, they ask the question and I smile, and they see my dentition, they say, this guy, this guy is very handsome. Even though he doesn't know the answer, this is smile can give us business. Uh, go and come back on Monday. Why? It's not of he that we let. See, when you come into this realm, things begin to happen to you, not because of what you deserve, but because of the grace of God. Somebody shout, I'm not a dummy. I have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is in me. I think like Christ. I can do all things. I am blessed. My mind is productive. 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 My mind is full of ideas, concepts, insights. My mind is unlocked. Productivity flows through my mind. Shout yeah, 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 yeah. Glory to God. Confusion has been wiped away from me. I cannot be confused. I have direction and clarity of thought. Even what I don't know, I know. I know all things. The anointing that abides in me teaches me all things. So by reason of that anointing, I know all things. Why? Because I know Christ. Why? Because Christ is the explanation of all things. For by him all things were made, and for him all things were made, and through him all things were made, and all things are made for him, and by him, whether they be thrones or principalities or powers, and I am complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. Shout yes, somebody. Complete in him. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. That's who I am. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Now we have a document. Listen very carefully. Called the New Testament and the Old Testament. That's what we call the Bible. And many people, to their minds, the Bible is Old and New Testament. Which is technically correct. But I've taught you a number of things in this church by now. But I'm going to just open a few things here tonight before we close. How many of you are glad you came to this service? If you're glad, wave your hands and shout, I love you, Jesus. Say my body, my mind, my spirit, saved, secured, purchased, paid for. No room for Satan. Amen. Yeah. This document called the Old and the New Testament, which is what we call the Holy Bible. When you technically look at it, Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 cannot be called the Old Testament. So the Bible, therefore, is not just Old and New Testament per se. For us to establish that the Bible is Old and New Testament, we have to rightly divide it. So let's begin. Where does the Bible refer to as Old Testament? Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6 because hebrews chapter 2 where we read introductorily we said there are two dispensations the ones given by angels and the salvation given by christ two 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 two, two, two compartments angels and christ hebrews 2 hebrews 8 look at it hebrews 8 verse number 6 but now had he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises verse 7 for if that first covenant had been faultless 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 then should no place have been sought for the second for the second for finding fault not with the covenant but with them to whom the covenant was given finding fault 
with the people that the covenant was given to. The covenant has no fault, but the people it is given to had fault. So the covenant came to find fault. Finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant. Now, this is where the old covenant began from. Which I made with their fathers. When? In the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. So the old covenant started in the day when God took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And that is Exodus. So Genesis is not part of the old covenant. Now listen carefully and I need you to intelligently, intellectually listen to me as we, as we, as we adventure doctrinally and intellectually because there's a room for intellectualism in the understanding of scripture by virtue of the quality of mind you have which is unlocked as the mind of Christ so therefore the old covenant is not a book When we say the old covenant, stop thinking of books. The old covenant is a relationship. So to understand the old covenant, you must look at the old covenant with the eyes of a relationship. Not books. With the eye of a relationship. The old covenant is a relationship. When we say relationship based on the law, any relationship based on the law animal sacrifices we see the old covenant anywhere you read in the bible where you see a relationship that is based on the law and based on practices of animals that relationship is what we call the old covenant wake up and listen right there in the same books that you call the old covenant where you see the law you will also see people there that didn't operate by the law so that means the old covenant is not a book the old covenant will be defined by a relationship somebody shout relationship i say shout i didn't say say i say shout let me shock you a little even in the new testament there are old covenant people Just like in the old covenant, there are New Testament people. Because it's no more a compactment. It's no more books. It's the relationships. The different relationships that existed at all the different times. It is those relationships that define whether it is Old Testament or New Testament. Teaching now. Somebody say relationship. Shout it very loud. One more time. Sela. In the New Testament, you will see the conduct of some people like Peter and James. You will see legalism. You will see law. In the conduct of people like Peter and James because they were Jews. And they came from the law. You will still see even in the writings of James some law in the book of James. Because the law is not books. It's relationship. If you understand this, I hear you. I'm not hearing you at all. Though. You will see that before Jesus came, there are people that functioned with God without law. They related with God, no law. Such people are not Old Testament. think so the kind of relationship that people had determined whether it was old testament or new testament 
and it began when they left Egypt and that relationship that they had with God when they came out of Egypt was a relationship that was governed by law that is why that relationship is called the Old Testament you will see in Galatians 3 15 let's get there brethren I speak after the manner of men though but a man's covenant yet if it be confirmed confirmed by who i speak after the manner of men though it be but a man's covenant yet if it be confirmed no man disannulled or added thereto confirmed by who now to abraham and his seed where the promise is made he saith not unto seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is christ 17. and this i say that the covenant that was confirmed before of god in christ the covenant was confirmed before of god in christ confirmed before of god in christ the law which was 430 years after after the covenant in christ so the covenant in christ before the law the law after after the covenant in christ so the covenant in christ older than the law because the law was after teaching here covenant in christ cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect so there are two dispensations the dispensation of promise and the law the law and promise the confirmation of that covenant is in christ so listen the law is what we refer to as old covenant the promise is what we refer to as new testament the law old covenant the promise new testament so which came first which came first now now wait till you're too much in a hurry you won't see it by reading books you won't see that this what i've just said now you won't see it just by looking at the way they arrange bible genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy and you won't see it like that the only way you will understand this is by understanding that the old covenant is a relationship and the new testament is also a relationship the old testament is a relationship of law the new testament is a relationship of promise that's the way to understand it see i hear oh i say see i hear so the promise came before the law what is promise promise is a self-guaranteed commitment god himself gave a commitment and the guarantee of that commitment is that god gave it finish god gave it that's a guarantee you don't need any other thing <laughs> you don't need any other thing god gave it as a guarantee but the law was guaranteed by their conduct the promise is guaranteed by the fact that it is god that gave it but the law is guaranteed by the conduct of the people if you do i do if you don't do i will not do the guarantee for the law is the conduct of the people but the guarantee of the promise is the commitment that the promiser has made by nature of who the promiser is that when he says it what it takes to fulfill it is inside what he said so when he says it it's as good as done so the guarantee for the promise is in the promise but the law is built on the conduct of the people if you pray 
I bless you. If you don't pray, I will not bless you. If you do, I will do. If you don't do, because that's the only guarantee people under the law have for the law to benefit them. Follow me. Follow me carefully. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 16. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Next verse. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto you the heirs of promise the inheritors of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath god confirmed it by an oath what did god do go back to verse 13 hebrew 6 he confirmed that if i promise i cannot fail and in that promise is god's oath verse 13 for when god made promise to abraham because he could swear by no greater he swore by himself how is god's promise it is a self-confirming act god's promise is a self-confirming act that once god promises in the promise is the oath of confirmation <laughs> you don't need to check it whether you are mindful of it or not the oath in it will confirm it you don't need to help it forever oh god thy word i didn't hear you because you did something because you prayed because you fasted because you interceded you're on the mountain what settled it eh? what settled it Eh? what settled the word the word is settled by itself because of the oath in the word coming out of god god is the oath because he couldn't swear by anybody he swears so he is both the word and the oath that backs the word to give the word a commitment to self-fulfillment without anybody guarantee god is a guarantee so under the promise God made a commitment by an oath and that oath is himself. That God himself was going to do what he said he will do independent of man. What about the law? In the law, you do this, I do this. The promise, I will, I will, I will. That's the distinction. So when you look at the 66 books, stop looking at books start studying relationships to understand the old from the new don't look at books look at relationships what those relationships were like tells you if it is old testament or new testament because after the 66 books you have been asked to rightly divide how do you rightly divide by these things you are hearing me teach now It's relationship. It's not books. Hey. It's relationship. How did God relate with the people? We reveal whether it's a law or it is promise. Whether it is old or it is new. So this was confirmed before of God. Where? This was confirmed before of God. Where? In Christ. That's right. The law which after 430 years cannot cancel the interruption of the law did not nullify the promise so that is to say even when the law was there the promise was still valid so that means even under the law you will see the promise still working for those that are related with the promise it is relationship teaching good <laughs> Glory to God. Yeesh. Thank you, Lord. So, therefore, what God said was self confirming. It was what? Self confirming. The law was weak. Why was the law weak? 
because the law lacked the empowerment to enable those it was given to to keep it for what the law could not do in that romans 8 3 in that it was weak the law is weak look at the weakness of the law hebrews 8 8 hebrews 8 8 8 8 for finding fault the law found fault with them the law was weak it couldn't help them to be faultless so when the law came the weakness of the law was revealed in the fact that all the law succeeded to do was to expose their faults the law didn't help them it didn't add to them it didn't do anything for them it just opened up their state it revealed the state of man to man amen i said amen so god now said i will establish a new covenant predicated upon the blood of jesus i will establish a new covenant predicated upon the blood of jesus it was going to be god in his wisdom being an incarnate son to himself it was going to be god in his wisdom being an incarnate son to himself It's the wisdom of God that made God become a son of himself. An incarnate son of himself. And being the son of man. Being an incarnate son of God. Then now he became the son of man. Guaranteeing and bringing to pass. What God said will happen. That's why the covenant was confirmed before of God. Where? In Christ. Christ is the guarantee. And Christ is God trapped in flesh as a man. Are you lost? If you are with me, shout a powerful amen. amen. So man is never a covenant partner with God. Never. Never. Don't let anybody ever deceive you that you and God are in a covenant. Never. Never, from what I've taught you right now. So here they say they're doing covenant of fruitfulness. Don't even let the hand deal near your house. You're not hearing me now. Look at me. I'm your pastor. When you hear them say they're doing oh, covenant of something, run. Because it appertained not to you. Say with me, I have no covenant with God. Are you afraid? Say it very loud. I am just a beneficiary of the promises. <laughs> the people that had covenant with God were Jews. Jews. Because it is they that were giving the law. <laughs> they had covenant. Romans 9. <laughs> See the way you're looking at me. <laughs> Romans chapter 9 verse 1. <laughs> Glory! Romans 9 1. I say the truth in Christ. Eh? I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness where? Abba, when a man has, has used all these factors to tie himself, know that what he's about to tell you is the truth and nothing but the truth. Next verse. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Verse 3. For I could wish that myself were a cause from Christ for my brethren. My kinsmen, according to the flesh. This is Paul talking about the Jews. These are my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Next verse. Who are Israelites? Are you here? If you are here, shout here. Yeah. Hold your neighbors like say, wake up, wake up. Something is about to drop. <laughs> who are israelites to whom pertained the adoption and the glory and the so the covenant is for jews they are the ones that the covenant pertains to we are not jews are you jewish 
What are you? You are a Nigerian. Total Gentile. <laughs> the Jews, they are the ones the covenant pertains to. And the giving of the law. And the service of God. And the promises. It pertains to the Jews. See, I hear. So, who are those that the covenant was given to? So, say with me, I am in no covenant with God. They are the ones. The kiss men of brother Paul in the flesh. See, I hear. So, we don't have a covenant with God. You're just a beneficiary. That is why when God gave them a covenant, he found fault with them. Because since it was a covenant, God had to look out for perfection. And he couldn't find. He couldn't find. Why couldn't he find? Because perfection was on the basis of keeping the covenant and keeping the laws. And they couldn't keep it. So the relationship, there was a problem. They failed. And when they failed, they couldn't partake. Many of them died because they were trying to be in covenant with God and they didn't have the capacity to be in covenant with God. Say, I hear you. I didn't hear you. God made the promise. God fulfilled the promise. You are just a beneficiary. No demands. No demands. No terms in the new covenant. You will never hear that the new covenant has terms. There are no terms in the new covenant. Terms are only in the old covenant. The new testament has no terms. Why? It was confirmed before of God where? In Christ. In Christ. Who is Christ? The word. It is confirmed of God in the word. That if God says it, that is it. Whether you do something or not. If you believe what God said, you collect. Beneficiary. Amen. The word had on it an oath. And that oath in the word made the word not wait for you to comply with anything. It fulfills itself. Amen. It was the word that God spoke that he confirmed. The word of God does not require human effort to come to pass. It comes to pass by itself. It is self-anointed. The word of God is self-confirming. Self-confirming. So God's dealings, therefore, with man is what we refer to as the new covenant or the old covenant. Therefore, the new or old covenant is a relationship. And you will see it in the kind of laws that were given to them in the old covenant. So let's backtrack a little. Let's backtrack. Let's backtrack. When we refer to the covenants, we are referring to laws. You cannot do covenant without laws. Every covenant will have laws. When we refer to the promise, we are referring to faith. Covenant, laws, promise, faith. Covenant, laws, promise, faith. There is no law in a promise. Eh? Philemon, come here. Take this handkerchief. I promised you some time ago that the next time I see you, I will give you a handkerchief. Take the handkerchief. What is that? Promise fulfilled. Any condition on his part? No. What did he do? He just came and did what? Collected. Without any effort. Why? Because I gave the word and in my word was the oath of confirmation. And because I have integrity, the next time he saw me, by my integrity in the oath of my confirmation, I delivered to him the handkerchief without question. So my word, therefore, is reflecting the weight of my person. That if I say it, I do it. I don't need to swear for him. My swearing is not for him. My swearing in is my word. His job is just to take me at my word and collect it. You don't need to fast for God to do it. You just take God at his word. And once you take him at his word, you take what he promised. 
Faithful is he promised. Who also himself will do it. He doesn't need your contribution. I'm teaching good. Eh? Go and keep it. Promise fulfilled. If you're enjoying tonight, shout a good hallelujah. So therefore, when we refer to promise, what are we referring to? When we refer to covenant, what are we referring to? So when we say, I am in covenant with God, what have you said? I am governed by laws. And it means we're in a legal, and if there's a default, there's a punishment. Hey. But when we say, me and God, we're in a promise relationship, what are you referring to? Faith. God said, I will do it. What do you say? I believe. And what happens? Performance. If there's a man to believe, there's a God to perform. For unto she that believeth, there shall be. Wave your hands, shout, I hear. I need you to understand this. I don't say, bring her. You follow me, you go see something. Just follow me, and you go see something. I'm tired. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, I, we know the Russia. But we don't, they, they, you know they like Russia at all. We they take them step by step. When you understand this and somebody is talking Bible, you, the moment you open mouth, you will know where it's coming from. You don't even waste your precious time. If it's Moses' junior brother, you close the door. You on TV, you see Moses, you close the TV. I'm teaching you so much. I'm dealing with the rudiments such that at a glance you can tell. So that you are not tossed to and fro with every wind because you are now established in grace and not with meat. It is good that the heart be established with grace and not with meat. Chopping practices that perish. Teaching. If you understand it, shout I hear. Okay. Galatians 3 11. Put it up. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Now, that word live is not like live, it's not like efforts. That word live means exist. The just shall exist. Pia. That's like, like I appeared. It's not like I did something. No, no. It's like I emerged. The just shall emerge. The just shall exist. By faith. Not works. The just shall emerge. The just shall come alive. By faith. Verse 12. And the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. The man that doeth them shall live in them. Eh? You are here? Verse 23. But before faith came. Eh? Before faith came. Come on, shut up. When we say covenant. When we say promise before faith came are you here we were kept under because anywhere there is law what do you have covenant anywhere there is promise what do you have anywhere there is faith what do you have eh? Eh? anywhere there is covenant what do you have anywhere there is law what do you have eh? Eh? all right so but before faith came we were kept under the law shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed so when faith was not there what did we have law and when we had law what did we have covenant 24 wherefore the law was our schoolmaster unto christ that we might be justified by faith. The Lord didn't bring us. But the Lord kept us. Until Christ came. When Christ came. The Lord gave way. And our justification. Didn't come by works. It came by faith. Hey. 
You understand it? Next verse. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Who is the schoolmaster? Law. Now, who is faith? Christ. Now that faith is come, what happens to the schoolmaster? Rusticated. Retired. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God. How? By faith. Not by law and not by covenant. By faith. In Christ Jesus. Are the scriptures coming alive? No, no, we are not covenant children. We are children of God. We are not covenant. Hey, hey. Don't call that word. We are children of God. Children don't have covenant. So the law is opposite of faith. Faith is opposite of the law. You can't be in law and faith. And you can't be in faith and law. You're either in law or you're in faith. You're either in Christ or in covenant. Did you? Hebrews 11.1 1. Who is happier than me in this house? I said who? Say I am no longer under a schoolmaster. No teacher is beating me with Koboko. Have you ever been under a schoolmaster before? They follow you with cane. Thou shall not. Thou shall not. Thou shall not. Bah, bah, bah. But now we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Why? Faith has come. And now in Christ, we don't have a covenant. We have promise. Standing on the promises of Christ, my king. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior. Standing, standing. I am standing on the promises of God. Hey, receive those promises manifest. Receive those promises manifest. Ah, Kabato, Kelama, Zekayo, Kereketa. I say, receive the promises manifest. Lift your legs, shout fire, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus is mine. Hallelujah, Jesus is mine. He has taken my shame. Behold the Lamb of God. He has taken my sickness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You people are making me a choir master now. So I am now a pastor and a choir master. <laughs> Who? Are you happy tonight? Who took it away? He took it, I don't have it. He took it, I don't have it. He took it, I don't have it. I am accepted in the beloved. I am complete in him. By his stripes, I am healed. I am the righteousness of God. We are... Who? Who? Sit down and look. Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is the substance of things so far, the evidence of things... Stand up. Let me close. Praise God. <laughs> we see Jesus. Who can see him? Can you see Jesus? Somebody shout, I have no covenant with God. I have a promise in Christ. I have a promise in Christ. I don't have a covenant. Because, listen carefully. In Christ is a family. And family is not covenant. 